Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlamagne the Guy. We are the Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. Yes, indeed. We have Dr. Lakeisha Holman. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I've been so excited to get here. Thank uh, you. And before we start, I really want to tell you all congratulations on everything that you're oh, doing. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. So you are the founder and CEO of The Village Market. I am headquartered in the amazing city of Atlanta. I founded The Village Market to accelerate black entrepreneurs in, in 2016. What is it exactly? Mm -hmm. um, the Village Market is a company that focuses on creating marketplaces, creating campaigns, and I also have a retail store at Punt City Market in Atlanta. But the purpose is upward mobility. I believe that cooperative economics in a real way should be tangible like that of, uh, like that of Tulsa. And that's what I've created with The Village Market. How did you get into mm. that? What, what, what started you with that? You know, it's an interesting career. I, I was a teacher for years. Um, I taught in the Mississippi Delta. I'm from Mississippi. How much do teachers make? We just had this. this not enough. It depends. I mean, not enough, clearly. But it not depends. enough. But let me tell you, my first salary in 2004 was $27,000. Geeks. Y'all, I thought I was rich, though. I was only 22 years old. But when you understand that now, that's not even a livable wage. Yeah. But I was teaching in Mississippi, Mississippi Delta $27,000 a year. Now, of course, you can cross state lines. Texas does pretty well. Of course, New York does well. Mm -hmm. um, and California does extremely well. For teachers? But, for teachers. It's, oh, wow. But well, well, compared to what, though? If, we, if we're comparing it to Mississippi, then it looks like teachers are being paid um, but I don't think t uh, teachers are paid enough. Not even close. My mom was an English teacher for over 30 years in, in, in uh, South Carolina. And I think the most she told us she ever made was 30 grand a year. Wow. And I was an English teacher when I started. So mm -hmm. shout out to your mom. Yeah. You know, I loved my students. The crazy part is I think people respected teachers a lot more when the pandemic, when, when people had to start teaching their kids themselves and, or being there and doing all the work. They're like, nah, we need to get these teachers back. We need to start paying them more because, we, you know, you don't realize how difficult it is because you're not just a babysitter. You're a teacher and a babysitter mm -hmm. and disciplinary. It's it's a lot of work. Absolutely. I know at least with my sister, with my two nephews, she was like, shout out to everything that you ever did in education. That's real. Because having to do that, having to parent, have, having to think about mental health of your kid, making sure that they're being creative and mm -hmm. all these things are being activated all while making sure that they're learning is tough. So, I mean, for every teacher that's out there on the front line, I congratulate them. I salute them. And I tell people being an entrepreneur has changed my life, but nothing set me up for this more wow. than those first years teaching in, in Mississippi Delta. I, I love what you said about um, group economics being tangible. Isn't that up to us, though, to make it tangible? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's up to us. Everything is up to us, right? So we have an uh, urgency at this time. Either we're going to be the answer or we're going to be the problem. And tangible means that we can open businesses that's cooperative, that when I opened the village market, it wasn't just me. I'm the founder of that. But now I represent thousands of businesses in Atlanta, outside of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. My retail store that I told you all about, the village retail, I gave over 40 businesses their first opportunity in mainstream uh, real estate in Atlanta. So that's a cooperative retail store that's an incubator. So being on the shelves that people can actually shop from you. And so that's what it means for it to be tangible. I love accelerators. I have my own. I love incubators. I have my own. But there should be something at the end of that. Again, I'm a former teacher. Experience is the best teacher. I want to put entrepreneurs in a place where you can be in front of your customer, where you can make some real money. Now, how can black businesses uh, receive more funding for their businesses? I know it's very difficult a lot of times to get money and to raise money. So. How can they do that? I'm going to name some people that's doing it. Do again, it. yes, n uh, tangible again. Mm -hmm. Collab Capital is based in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. New Voice is fun. I think they're based here in New York. Um, Fearless Fun. Aaron is doing a great job. But these are three funds. And, do and no, there's more funds out there. But these funds are being led by black folk. Uh, Collab Capital raised over $50 million last year. And now they have a portfolio of people like Tracy Pickett from Hair Brother are being funded by them. Mm -hmm. What Arian Simone is doing with Fearless Fund is incredible. Putting funding behind black women and new voices, you name a company. They led um, Richard Lou Dennis. When you all see that Pinky has a, a hundred million dollar valuation, a black man led that rounding for that, that funding ground for her. 
Um, so shout no, out to Slutty Rich. Vegan, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pinky yeah. Cole from Slutty Vegan. Dr. Pinky Cole. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, is it easy to get the money though? No, absolutely, it's not easy to get the money. <laughs> absolutely not. I mean, that, again, it's not easy to get the money. But what has been easy for Black yeah. folk? You yeah. know, yeah. either if we we know the odds are there, but it, it takes some fearless people who are persistent enough and who wants to agitate the system to make sure that we get the money that we need. I, I, I saw this stat and it kind of blew me away because when you think of Atlanta, you think that's like the black business mecca, right? But according to Prosperity Now, Atlanta's black businesses are valued at $58,085 compared to Latinx businesses at over 450000 and white businesses at over 650000 yeah. That's crazy. I don't even want to call that a gap. That's just... No, that, <laughs> no, just that is... <laughs> that is disrespectful. The why? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean why? because this country is built on capitalism. Mm -hmm. So anytime that there is pro uh, anytime that there is wealth, there is a desperation of poverty, and that's be it Atlanta, be it Mississippi, be it in L.A. You're gonna always see this gap. Now, what I do know that's true about Atlanta: if there is a city where black people can have upward mobility, Atlanta is the city for it. Mm -hmm. But when you see a pervasive wealth gap like that, we can't stay in our bubble of saying that it is the black mecca. It's the city that can be the black mecca because mm -hmm. we also lead the country, one of the leading cities in a country that has the most black millionaires, and also. Um, the generating of black businesses are now growing from that 50,000 to getting close to that seven, 75,000, 100,000. But what that means, when you get to a place where you're making some real cash, it means you can hire folks. Mm -hmm. And what's true about black people, when we start our companies, just like I have, I'm a serial entrepreneur. And if, if Angela Yee was here, she would talk about this as well. We hire our own people. That's right. And so we improve our communities. But that number, Charlemagne, that you mentioned, that's a, that's a number that should wake people up. Um, but it tells you that we're not there. We have not yet arrived to this destination. But I know that Atlanta is a city that can do it. Now, you also talk about, you know, I'm reading the same studies that said approximately 28 days money stays in the Asian communities, 19 days in Jewish communities, 17 days in white communities, and just six hours in black communities. Why is that I'm, I, can we, we start with anything? Is that, is that the reason why? For commercial real estate, yes, right. So when when these developers are coming into cities, um, we're not controlling what's being open. We don't own the land. Again, if any time there is wealth, there is poverty. But any time there is where we're in a place of constant leasing and not owning, we have no true say so of what's going to be open in those communities. Mm -hmm. But the circulation of the dollar is, I mean, overt racism, racism again. Mm -hmm. You think about Tulsa, Oklahoma, when it was true that our dollar circulated in our communities. But what happened with upward mobility when we produced so many, so many black millionaires, when so many black businesses were being funded from insurance to teachers to the dude that cut your lawn to the guy that shaped up your beard were all black folks. We were winning during that time, and then bombs were dropped dropped on us, and this black city was burnt down. And there was no way, even though there was insurance there, they wouldn't even grant their insurance claims. Mm. So what happens in this country when black people began to accelerate, then literally the air is knocked out of us, and we're pushed down farther than where we were before we started. So that is why that number is persistent. It was created to be that way. But we have to know that that number is there. But we can't wait on other people to, to shop from us. There's enough black people in this country to shop from black people. But I do know that it's also amazing that other people are shopping from black folks, too. That's right. I, I love what, what, what you're doing. Um, you know, I love anybody that can help our people get capital. But I, I feel like black people have to have the financial literacy component to go with that because people can make money and still find a way to mess it up. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you know? we, we see it all the time. We, we see it all, all the time. time. We see it in our young athletes all the time. Um, and it, that's not their fault. Right. The system has to be insulated and we have to wrap that village. What I believe around around these young millionaires and people who are experiencing wealth for the first time. I can't imagine what I would have done at 18, 19 years old being presented by hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. I probably would have bought something crazy, too. With, with no information to go with. It. I was talking to a board I've read earlier and I was saying how, like, you know, when you get a check automatically know that half of that check is going to the IRS. Absolutely. And he was like, I never thought about that. It's true. It's true. <laughs> you know? One yeah, thing. But I didn't think about that early on either. Yeah. Oh, I didn't no. think about it. You, you get that whole check, you're like, this is my check. Yeah. And Somebody then, tell you, you're making this a year. You think I'm, this is what I'm. This is what I'm making. Yeah. And then when, when you learn, when you have to actually pay back, you're like, oh, whoa, this Oof. is not what I made. Yeah. So one thing that my accountant has really trained me to do, that every time I get paid, 25% goes somewhere else, 10% mm -hmm. goes somewhere else. And he said, what you're left with? 
Now you can do something with that if you like. But he also says that money just sitting is not money that's making money. Correct. So where would you advise people to put that money? Of course, I'm going to say put the money in black businesses. Mm -hmm. But if we can, if we look at those who've had economic prosperity, the people that we celebrate, they've invested their money. They're invested their money in in technology. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm I'm still learning about this uh, NFT industry, Mm -hmm. but I'm hearing that people are investing money there. I don't know enough about it. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I'm I'm, Mm -hmm. I'm with you on that. I have no (laughs) idea, but I do know. Old school with the real estate, you know. I'm still very much so old school. Yes. Uh, two friends of mine, uh, Jewel Burke Solomon and Tracy Pickett, we we purchased a commercial property in Atlanta together, mm-hmm. and that's an example. When you have some extra extra cash on you, put your money together with your friends and buy property mm-hmm. because we know what happens on Peter Street now that we're going to be one of the deciding factors because we're not leasing; we own this space now. Correct. That's what it is. Do you feel that black people supporting black businesses is growing? Oh, absolutely. I think it's growing. Um, what is really shifting rather than growing is that our consciousness is shifting. Mm-hmm. I think we're in a, in a very special time. Uh, I, I wrote a couple of weeks ago that I believe that we're in our renaissance because when it's, things are desperately bad, there's also something that's pervasively really good. Mm-hmm. Um, and you hear more people now not just t- talking about buying black, but you see entrepreneurs on the cover of magazines. When when did that happen? Right. Yeah, yeah. When did that happen? And we're talking about people getting their valuations. We're talking about companies being acquired. I look at what happened with the gathering spot in Greenwood. Mm-hmm. My, um, shout out to my friends Ryan and TK and what they did. That is black collaboration. Mm-hmm. But I think, though, we have to make sure that in our consciousness that buying black, hiring black, referring black is a part of our lifestyle. And having grace. And the reason I say having grace is, we know, it's so funny, we talk about it all the time. How many times you go to McDonald's and they mess up your order? Or you go in, or the, the, the ice cream machine ain't working. But if you go to a black business and they mess up one time, you ready to go on Instagram and say, I'm never coming back. They, like People have to understand there has to be a learning curve as well because this is new to a lot of us, especially when, when these businesses come. Yeah, I mean, you think of, and grace is my word, so I'm happy you said that. You mm-hmm. see how, how big I smile. That's my word for the year. I think that's the that's the word for our generation that we must have with black businesses, but we should have overall, even if you're a business or not, but just as the humanity of black people together. Um, black businesses, as, as you mentioned, and when Charlemagne asked me about the cash, there's no way that you can compete with an Amazon with your shipping and things like that. And most, 96% of um, black entrepreneurs, when they start, it's just them. Mm-hmm. It's just them that had this aspiration of opening up the coffee shop. It's just them that at, at first was in a barber cutting hair before they were able to scale and get some other people in a seat. Mm-hmm. When you know that your HR, when you are your legal services, when you are your branding and marketing, even when it's you pretending that it's your assistant that's answering the email, that's you. <laughs> and, most entre- <laughs> and most entrepreneurs know that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that's why that grace is, is necessary. Now, grace doesn't eliminate for us to operate in excellence, though. I think it's a dual responsibility for the community to have grace. And I think there's a responsibility for black businesses that we should try within everything within us to get it right. Yeah, because I might not have grace money, meaning I, that I don't have money real. to spend for, for you to mess up. I need right. you to get it right the first time. Absolutely. Or at least and if you don't get it right the first time, what is your customer service on the end of that? That's right. To let you know that you tried your best. Now, what is what is our village united? That's my nonprofit. Okay. Um, again, I, when you start a business, then you think of like five more. Mm-hmm. Um, I started, I launched Our Village United actually in 2017, but I didn't get it going until the pandemic when so many sole proprietors were, were applying for PPP loans and didn't get it. It, I, it. it kept me up at night. And I said, I need to create an incubator that's just for single operators, mm-hmm. for that person that is just them. And so our Village United focuses on a 12-week incubator. We graduated our 100 businesses since the pandemic about two, two three weeks ago. Um, but we provide full services for 12 weeks to entrepreneurs, and then they graduate into our incubator program, which means you're a part of the village now. Um, but from CPA services, and and we all know the tax season just, just ended, but we make sure that they're in front, front and center. We also make sure one of the things that I experienced, especially as my, my company began to boom, my anxiety spiked. Oof. I found myself being more anxious than I ever experienced. Mm-hmm. And I made sure that our Village United was paired with, with mental health services. So every entrepreneur that's a part of the village is then paired with Dr. Joy Beckwith. Shout out for her, um, who is our licensed therapist. On, on our staff who works with these entrepreneurs in focus groups mm-hmm. and also one-on-one because I don't want us to have, have the wealth without the health. 
And I don't think that we should talk about these things in silos anymore. When we think of upward mobility, we think of upward mobility in our spirits. And that's what I'm working and creating with, with our Village United. Yeah, Sarah Jakes Roberts said, because uh, I, I asked her about that, you know, when how come whenever you achieve something new or go to a new level, your anxiety mm-hmm. starts to go crazy? And she said, because you're experiencing something new. Absolutely. And that's, that's just how I embrace it. Like, oh, like it's not because I, I feel like that's when this the anxiety is expected. You know, Absolutely. it's when the anxiety is not expected that causes you to have the panic attacks. But when you're trying something new, doing something new, yeah, you should feel that way slightly. Yeah. And mm-hmm. if you're the first one in your family, there's a lot of guilt around that. Mm-hmm. Um, you're the person that got out. Mm-hmm. I'm from Mississippi. I'm mm-hmm. one of the few people in my family, if not the only person, uh, at least on my mother's side, who is deceased, who is doing the things that I, I'm doing. And there's a level of pressure to make sure that I'm looking out for my little cousins, that everywhere I go, that I'm, I'm talking about Mississippi, uh, talking about Marx and Batesville and Crowder, Mississippi, and in very affirming ways, because I know right now I have the mic and the responsibility that when you have the mic, how you talk about your people, how you talk about your experiences. Now we see that you hooked up with Michael Jordan Brand. Yeah, oh, yeah. And he invested, he invested in the OVU. Yeah, tell us how you partnered with him. You know, that blew my mind. I am. I personally think that Michael Jordan is the best basketball player to have ever played. You, I, you'd be right. I, I think I'm right, I too. You, y'all agree? Okay. So when um, the Jordan brand announced that they would be funding, I think, 13 uh, organizations, we put our name in a hat. I didn't know what was going to happen, but I knew that my team, and my team is incredible. I, I know that we're sharp. And so Michael Jordan, um, we found out last year that we were one of the 13 organizations in the country that is f- funded by Michael Jordan. That's and dope. and what they're doing is they get us money to do what we do well. They didn't ask us to change our programming. Is what you asked me earlier. Like you need the money to be able to scale. And the Jordan Foundation say, here's the money. Y'all go ahead and do what you're doing and make sure you stay true to your 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 core values. Wow, that's dope. So what's some of the next business moves you got planned? Our partner, um, when you all visit Atlanta, make sure you stop by the Village Retail. But when you all come, right behind Pun City Market is the Beltline. And that is the that is currently two million people frequent this place. Um, now, because of that, the surge in commercial rents have gone up. It is almost unaffordable to open a business there, especially if you're black. I partner with Atlanta Beltline and the Candida Fund to open six more black businesses on the Beltline. So that is putting six businesses in front of two million annual customers. That that's averages about 350,000 people per, per month that they're going to be in front of. Mm-hmm. So we've got the funding to open these businesses, to build them out fully, to get them the technical assistance support. And when you all visit Atlanta, hopefully in July, you'll be able to walk on the belt line with your family, but also shop from black businesses. So with the... Uh. Yeah, with the Atlanta Beltline, that's huge. Mm -hmm. That is a game changer that I'm hoping becomes a national model, not just Atlanta. I'm hoping this happens in in New York. I'm hoping it happens out in L.A. Wherever there's a Main Street, black people should be there. So that's happening in Atlanta. And then I'm so proud that I was able to get a big grant from Kellogg Foundation, $750,000, to scale my work to Mississippi. Yeah, I'm I'm a proud, proud Mississippian, and I know that I know where I come from. I know it's nothing like country folk and, and the way that country people really look out for you. And, and But I also know that people there have never seen all the things that they can be. That's right. And I believe that it needs to be in front of you. It needs to be real. And I think one of the so- solutions to poverty is entrepreneurship. I don't think it's for everybody. I'm not one of those. But who is for? I want people to have options. So we're expanding Elevate Mississippi this September. I'm going to partner with some HBCUs. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, my my HBCU, Tougaloo College um, in, in Mississippi, to really get this program off the ground. But the goal, though, when, when Mississippians look back at this program, I want results. I want people to say, when I was a teacher, I made 27000 but as an entrepreneur, I made 250000 I want them to know that both mm-hmm. possible. And if you want to do both, do both. But I just want, especially the children there, especially my little cousins, to know that you don't only have to work in factories. I'm not mad at it. Both my parents worked in factories. My dad worked in a factory now, and he afforded me everything that I have. Right. But I, I do know that it needs to be put in front of you, all the things that you have potential of becoming. Well, right. shout to you, and shout to Mississippi. My roommate in college was from Mississippi, LeVar Thompson. Shout to LeVar. LeVar is a good you man. You know you want to do it. You know you want to do it. Am I? Cook a letter. Don't do it. 
<laughs> well, we thank you for joining us, Dr. Lakeisha Holman. How can people get in touch with you if they want to get in touch with you? Absolutely. Um, especially for entrepreneurs, if you want to get in co- contact with us, it's the villagemarket.com. If you want to open a business and you or if you have a business, a product facing, you want to be in a retail store, that's a beautiful retail store. That's the villageretail.com. And those who are going to be at Essence Festival, I'm, I'm very happy that we're working to curate their marketplace stage. Um, so we partner with Essence. So I hope to see y'all there this this summer. But villagemarket.com on all platforms. If you want to keep up with me, I do a tweet every now and then and then post it on Instagram. Mm-hmm. It's Dr. Key Hallman. All right. It's the Breakfast Club. Good morning. 